Hi and welcome to Stardo, the show for the American entrepreneur. I'm Chris Franks. The heart of every entrepreneur is an innovator. And today we'll be talking to some legendary innovators to help us get in touch with our inner Thomas Edison. We'll be speaking to the former CTO at Hewlett Packard and a man who Vanity Fair calls the innovation guru. Mr. Phil McKinney will share his four steps for founding a company. In our drawing board segment, we'll talk to a guy that I like to call the Dalai Lama of startups. Mike Stimple will talk to us about a technique called trend mapping, so your startup can avoid being just another Me Too company. Also check in with Adam Fish of Startup Kentucky, and don't miss our special edition of Office Freak Out of the Week, tonight on Stardo. <laughs> So what's new in the world of entrepreneurship? YouTube is giving away up to $50 million in free advertising services to small businesses across the U.S. to promote the launch of AdWords for Video. Each new subscriber will get a $75 credit towards their first campaign. According to Google, the YouTube video ads drive an average of a 20% increase in traffic to your site and a 5% increase in searches for your business. There might be something to this whole video thing. Get started, visit google.com slash adwords slash video. Last week, MIT Media Lab turned its eye in the future at their spring 2012 event. Leaders in the world of tech, science, and culture came together to talk about their vision on how the next wave of innovation is shaping up. On display were new technologies and robotics that can mimic human behavior, a musical instrument that can be played with your face, and even a prosthetic brain implant that will allow scientists to implant memories into your head. That's insane. Speaking of the future, this week's installment of The Drawing Board, we talked to the incomparable Mike Stemple on what it takes to focus for the future. So one of the things I do is a process I call trend mapping. It's being able to filter through all the data that's out there and find true trends, focus in on those trends, and project out into the future where they actually collapse into an opportunity. We have trends, we have the past, we have the future, we have data. We're all on the same playing field at this. Imagine a trend and then in the future it shoots off in a certain direction. And you might have another trend that you're tracking shooting off into the future. You have another trend. This is actually the way most startups focus on building companies. They try to find convergence of trends in present day, build technology on that, but they don't understand that as time progresses, that trend becomes old news. And that's why you see a lot of Me Too type companies. So let me show you how I do it. I follow the trends as they're coming out. And I look for trends that are actually converging well out into the future. Basically, I'm guessing and where a trend is going to be based upon the data I have. And I focus in on this spot. It could be months, it could be years in the future, but that's where I focus on because I know I have very little competition that's thinking of that far into the future. Most companies play in this space, which I call the incremental change. And this is where a lot of VCs invest, believe it or not. They're focusing on these small little features on top of a larger platform that can get gobbled up in a very small period of time. So what happens is when I focus on an opportunity here, I lasso that opportunity. I take multiple trends, lasso them, and then I can control the actual trend itself because I am the dominant SME in the space, subject matter expert. So then I can actually help guide my company and control the trend and move it in the direction I want. My job every day is how do I build a bridge from here back to the present? How do I figure out exactly what needs to be built technology-wise, team-wise, to be able to cross this chasm over incremental change, to leapfrog all my potential competitors, and be at the right place at the right time with the right technology and the right team to maximize this opportunity, grab it, and control it and own it. So my job as CEO every day is to be a SME. 
I become the subject matter expert of this space right here. And what that means is in America, I'm probably the most knowledgeable person on Bluetooth LE, smartphone apps, and accessories. And what happens is when this trend starts to develop and the mainstream media grabs hold of it, and they flip through the Rolodex of who they can talk to, who's the expert, my name pops at the top of the list. You have to be able to articulate this future opportunity in written, pictures, and pitch. You gotta be able to talk about it, draw it, and write about it very, very cohesively. I mean, it has to be a really well put together thought. You gotta have the facts, the trends to prove. You gotta have the data that builds the trends to prove it. And then you gotta write it, draw it, and be able to talk about it. If you can't do those three, then you need to find co-founders that can help you with those three. This is hard to do, it's painful to do. This chasm is very, very scary. It's very, very high. If you're scared of heights or scared at all, this is difficult to do. You might wanna practice doing this, but I actually think this is not the way to go. I think in America right now, um, I, I do a speech called the death of innovation. It's because we are all being taught by the techerati bloggers, VCs, educators, to build incremental change companies. And we're not really focusing on solving really complex, hard problems anymore, and really trying to create innovative new products. Get the data, pick your trends, figure out where they're gonna come, try to convince people that it's gonna be there, figure out the bridge of the technology and the team to get there. That's how you build a company. takes all this to bring you this. You need all this to get this. Hi, I'm Yul Kwan. Join me as we travel across the country and discover the who, what, where, and wow of what makes America work. This is America Revealed. Wednesdays at 10, 9 central, starting April 11, only on PBS. Welcome back. Part of the reason why we, the startup geeks, are suddenly too cool for school is all the attention we're getting through the Startup America Partnership. In tonight's report, we welcome our latest member to the Startup America Partnership family, Startup Kentucky. Joining us today is Adam Fish. Adam is a co-founder of Rubik and on the steering committee of Startup Kentucky. Startup Kentucky is the latest member of the Startup America Partnership family. Welcome, Adam. Hey, Chris. Uh, thanks for having me. So tell us what's going on in Kentucky. Why did Startup America Partnership choose to come there next? Well, we're doing a lot of great things here. I'm not uh, from Kentucky originally. Moved here two years ago, but quickly realized that Kentucky had a lot of entrepreneurial activity. Everything from biosciences to a lot of interesting tech companies. There's a lot happening in Kentucky, and we wanted to bring it to the national scale. So did I hear something about startups taking over the Kentucky Derby? What's that all about? Well, you know, in Kentucky, the biggest event of the year is the Kentucky Derby. And so we wanted to take advantage of that and really highlight the other great startup activities that are occurring in Kentucky. So Scott Case, the CEO, uh, is coming in for the Derby and Oaks, which is the event the day before. And he's going to be meeting with lots of startups. And we're going to have a, an event after the Derby, very informal for startups all across the state to meet with Scott and others. And we also completed a uh, pitch competition. So two winners um, are going to be coming in for uh, from a, the national competition, coming in for the Derby to meet with Scott and uh, others from the state. So you guys are just getting started out there. What can we expect to see from you guys in the future in Startup Kentucky? Well, you know, the, the great thing and the reason I wanted to get involved, I run an organization called Forge in Town 2 that puts on events. And there's a lot of other great organizations here in Louisville and Lexington, uh, Northern Kentucky, uh, even down in Southern Kentucky. And we thought Startup America was perfect because it was a way for all the organizations in Kentucky to, to work together even more um, you know, internally, but at the same time, we can start to broadcast everything that's happening here in Kentucky to other states um, and across across the country and uh, compete, you know, with the with the what's going on at the coast. That's very, very cool. Adam, thanks so much for your time today. No problem. Thanks for having me. A few days ago, we were fortunate enough to host a special engagement here at the Stardo Loft, headlined by Phil McKinney and followed by a really great party. My interview with the author of Beyond the Obvious is coming up next, but first, here's a snippet of the event. 
And they go, but, but I just told you what I need. I'm like, it's really the best I can do. Amazingly enough, they would go back to their desk and they would figure out how to do it. Because the problem is, is when you use the exact same processes to calculate how long it takes, you're following the old rules. You need to be willing to innovate in everything you do, even the approach on how you build the product, even how you define the product, how you prototype it. Everything is open to change. And by forcing what I call constraint-based innovation, the team had to throw out the rule book and find a completely new and different way in order to bring that innovation to the market. Now, while the vast majority of our show is dedicated to people that are doing startups, we like to include one segment each week that shows what the rest of the people out there that are toiling in the salt mines of corporate America are doing. Office freak out of the week. Office Freak Out of the Week. <sighs> so, yeah. I don't see if I blame that guy. Anybody else was like the TPS report guy that was office based, where he would beat the fax machine to death? That was fantastic. 40% of our returning veterans will struggle with post traumatic stress and other invisible wounds. In 2011, male veterans under 25 had an unemployment rate of almost 30%. We have been at war for 10 years, and for many, the battle continues at home. There have been more suicides by military veterans than there were lives lost in Iraq and Afghanistan combined. They are two times more likely to be divorced, three times more likely to be unemployed, and four times more likely to commit suicide. Many of our military veterans need help transitioning home. Let's not make the same mistakes we made in the past. LifeQuest Military Transitions is a 501c3 nonprofit that could use your help in serving those who serve this country. We fought for you. We have fought for freedom. Please support LifeQuest Military Transitions. Thank you. Welcome back to Stardo, the show for the American entrepreneur. Today's guest is the author of Beyond the Obvious, Phil McKinney. Phil, thanks for being here. Oh man, great to stop by. Talk to us first about, you're kind of considered the guru of innovation. <laughs> so I'm a guy who's out in the world and I've got a day job and I have this one idea. What steps do I need to take to start translating that idea in innovation? Well, the steps that I would recommend is you break it down into four elements. One is what I call the market validation. Validate the problem exists. Second phase. Customer validation, hook by crook, do a flash video, whatever, fake up something that you can now go back to that customer and say, remember we talked about it, you, we, we validated this was the problem, here's what we're working on that we think could be a possible solution and get the feedback and that's what you iterate before you actually go off and actually build something or do anything. And then the third phase is get in the market, do a limited launch. Maybe that's friends and family, or maybe it's just your, your buddies at the local bar, or whatever. And then get into, okay, now ramp this thing up and launch it. Well, you know, so much of the time I see really bright engineers and really bright entrepreneurs that go out and start building something. They go right, they start coding day one. Absolutely, and it's beautiful. It's a great product. I mean, they've got incredible UI, they've got incredible uh, features, and it turns out, Nobody actually, they're solving a problem that doesn't exist in the world. It's the biggest issue where entrepreneurs think of themselves. You know, I've got this problem, so therefore there must be millions of people like me. No, you're unique. You are not a representative of that customer. So you have to get that validation. I, I read something recently about a company that 
has an amazing product and a very successful startup and they cannot keep employees because their product's amazing and their culture is awful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, I mean, they, they've been able to innovate on one aspect, but they left that other aspect of their own culture and their own people development kind of off to the side. Well, now you're hitting a passion point for me on culture. Most organizations don't put any thought process into the culture. They just let the, the culture emerge. Whatever happens, happens. Right. But what you find, though, is culture eats strategy for lunch. It doesn't matter what the CEO dictates as the strategy. If it doesn't align with the culture, the culture will reject that strategy. Some executive makes a decision and says, we're going to go this direction. And if, the, if it's counter to the culture, the culture just kind of goes into a slow roll. Hmm. Nothing happens. You know, the organization's slow to change. And particularly if you have no culture, then your ability to muster the organization to go attack a problem or to innovate is non-existent. It all comes from a command and control model. And in today's creative economy, command and control does not work. We need to think of different management structures to support the ability of creating cultures and teams that drive this high level of innovation. I think about all the really cool startups I know, and all of them have this palpable sense when you walk in the office. You can feel it. Mm -hmm. There's kind of a sense of electricity. Is that what we're talking about with culture? Well, it's more than that. I mean, people come be, you know, to startups and that because of one, they're passionate about maybe the, the space or it's using some cool technology that people are interested in or um, they're, they're coming back with a team that they were really close with someplace else so they want to re-experience something that happened in a previous life. You know, here's kind of our mission and objectives as an organization, and here's the things that we hold near and dear. You know, teamwork, you know, transparency, ethics, and, and these are kind of the clear lines that we don't cross. You need to be able to communicate that effectively to every pe person in the organization, because what they're going to do is culture what allows people to make decisions and not make decisions. Hmm. You know, we see it now on the front page of the Wall Street Journal with these companies where CEOs are getting, you know, arrested for, for crimes or whatever, right? If an organization, you know, had a clear guideline on a zero tolerance for certain actions, the employees understand it. They know that's the rule. If you cross the line, no matter who you are, you're going to get nailed for it. At the same time, if you're family oriented, put your policies in place for the, you know, that, that support that. Define what it is. Why do you exist? Not to make money. Go beyond that. Why do you exist? Then how do you communicate that to everybody that you hire? How do you instill in them the same passion you as a founder have? I'm a startup and I've gone through and I've gotten uh, some great insights. I've figured out, I've gone through the steps. I've actually built something and I get it out into the marketplace. And I am okay, but I'm not setting the world on fire. What questions would you recommend that we start to ask ourselves as entrepreneurs when we're not, I kind of call it zombie land. Mm -hmm. You're not quite dead, like you haven't failed, but you're not fully successful. You haven't reached the goal. Well, I think the point is, is don't stop innovating. The biggest problem people have is, is they focus on one innovation, be a product. They kind of get it out the door and they're going to go, oh, now I can finally relax. Yeah. I can finally take that one week's vacation with my spouse or whatever. No. <laughs> Sorry, you don't get a vacation. You don't get a vacation. Yeah. It is a constant daily push. So if you've innovated and you think you have the best product, look at all the other areas that you could be innovating. Innovation is about being noticed. Hmm. If you're caught in the noise because you're the fifth, you know, restaurant advisory application or the, the 25th, you know, geo check-in app, how do you stand out? And the problem is, is we've all been taught through school conformity, right? Think about your school years. You all want to look the same, you want to act the same, don't stand out, because if you stand out, you get picked on, sure. right? But as soon as you become an entrepreneur and as soon as you become an, an innovator, you know, getting stuck in the crowd is, is, is death. Got just a few minutes left, but a couple of things I want to talk about. You talked, I believe it was in one of your podcasts, about the, I think, 14 steps of a company, fertilization, trigger event, the decision to start a business. The next one is the one, find a mentor. What does that mean? Because it's difficult in a lot of settings around the country where there's not a ton of people out there in the innovation space. How does one go about trying to find a mentor? And once you find that, how should you utilize that person? Well, I'm a big believer in mentorship, whether it's mentorship and innovation or just general business mentorship. 
you know, I was the beneficiary of a phenomenal mentor earlier in my career. You know, a guy by the name of Bob Davis, who's now uh, retired, lives in Phoenix. And I give him a lot of credit for the success I've had. Um, and what, you know, in fact, when I had a conversation with Bob years ago about how do I pay it back, his point was you can't pay it back. You have to pay it forward. You know, so he tasked me with mentoring others as I got successful in my career. But be careful. It isn't just about finding someone who's famous or who's known in a specific area. The key is, is do they have expertise that they can provide you a unique perspective? Are you truly going to treat them as a mentor, meaning are you going to listen? You need to be comfortable enough to where you tell them everything because they need to see that full picture in order to advise you, personal life, professional life. But you also, have, it has to be a match. You know, just because someone is older doesn't mean they're always smarter, Sure. right? So you need to find somebody that you mesh with and you have a, a good relationship with. And you have to have a mentor that is going to be willing to commit the time. There's a lot of people say, yeah, I'll mentor, and it's you know, one, one hour a quarter. That's not mentoring. Mentoring is, uh, is a, is a long-term you know, long relationship. So how can people find the book? Beyond the obvious, it's uh, out in hardcover in all the major bookstores. It's also available digital on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and on iTunes, and there's the audio book. And I've got to highly recommend just a personal uh, thing. I love your podcast. You do a podcast once a week? Once a week, Killer Innovations. It's now just... Uh, March 22nd was the seven-year anniversary for the podcast, and uh, the entire back catalog is available. We were talking just before the show, you podcast, not just before podcasting was cool, before there was iTunes. Yeah, I started podcasting before the iTunes support came around. That's so amazing. Back in the, uh, the early days we, when you had to hand build all your, your, all your tools and everything to make podcasts happen. And how can people get in touch? Uh, my website's philmckinney.com, and uh, all the information is there. Awesome. Phil, thanks so much for your time. We really appreciate you coming by. Thanks, man. So, startup friends, I have a request. Take 30 seconds out of your day and go to Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn or Foursquare, whichever social networking site you prefer, and tell the world about the amazing work that Startup America Partnership is doing. And hey, while you're there, why not go ahead and give Stardo TV some love by following us on Twitter at, at Stardo TV or on Facebook at facebook.com slash Stardo TV.